Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to New Books and National Security, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm John Sacklariatus, the host of the channel. On the show today, we are pleased to have Dr. Stephen Biddle. Dr. Biddle is a professor of international and public affairs at Columbia University, a member of the Arnold A. Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies, and an adjunct senior fellow for defense policy at the Council on Foreign Relations. In addition to his academic work, Dr. Biddle has served on the Defense Department's Defense Policy Board, on General David Petraeus' Joint Strategic Assessment Team in Baghdad, as a senior advisor to the Central Command Assessment Team in Washington, as a member of General Stanley McChrystal's Initial Strategic Assessment Team in Kabul in 2009, among other government advisory panels and analytic teams. Today, we'll be talking to Dr. Biddle about his remarkable new book, Non-State Warfare, The Military Methods of Guerrillas, Warlords, and Militias. Dr. Biddle, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Dr. Biddle, security studies geeks have been anciently awaiting the latest Dr. Stephen Biddle book since 2004, when you published Military Power. Superficially, the difference between that book and this one are substantial. Military Power was about great power military methods in conventional combat, and non-state warfare is about, well, non-state actors. When and why did you begin thinking about non-state actors? Yeah, I spent most of my career, of course, thinking about interstate warfare, hence the earlier book. Um, But like a lot of people in this field, as the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, increasingly became characterized by insurgencies, anybody who tries to make their research relevant to the conduct of policy, then ought to be interested in the problem of insurgencies in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. And as I turned my attention to those conflicts, uh, I began seeing in non-state actors in these conflicts behavior that was quite different from what the kind of ordinary garden variety common assumption about non-state military methods would lead one to expect. Uh, you know, for example, I'd done studies of the early putatively conventional phases in Afghanistan and in Iraq, but towards the end of the initial more or less conventional phase in Afghanistan, there was this action uh, in Operation Akanda in the Shaikot Valley of Afghanistan uh, in 2002, in which the United States thought it had found and cornered a collection of Al-Qaeda terrorists. Uh, And so we we mounted this fairly large-scale uh, airborne infantry operation to encircle and destroy this this terrorist hideout that we had discovered in the high mountain valley. And instead of behaving the way you expect insurgents to do, right, fire off a few rounds, melt into the countryside, you know, escape to fight again another day rather than uh, contest ground or decisively engage superior forces, Al-Qaeda contested ground and decisively engaged superior forces. They hung in there. They prepared fighting positions, they dug in, they concealed themselves, and they slugged it out toe-to-toe with a sizable force of American infantry. Uh, And with, you know, a reasonable amount of success, they were heavily outnumbered and outgunned, but but they, you know, put up a tough fight. Uh, And so that got me wondering, uh, is this an aberration? Is this a one-off? What is responsible for this? How common is it? Should we expect to see more of it? Uh, And that got me increasingly interested in this general issue of how does this other class of actor, not states and interstate conflict, but these non-state actors fighting either states or each other, and how do they behave and why do they behave that way? Uh, And the the more time I spent with the issue, the more struck I became by how unhelpful the kind of standard received views of the subject were and and the degree to which they tended to kind of uh, channel people's thinking and shape even what people saw, right, when they looked at the the same combat actions in ways that I I think were misleading uh, and tended to uh, misapprehensions of how a class of actor that the United States has been crossing swords with increasingly in the time since then behaves, is likely to behave, uh, and why. And so that that got me interested enough in it that I decided to pursue it more systematically and ultimately at uh, exhaustive and exhausting 
um, book length. As it stands, I'd say there's two, maybe two and a half leading theories that ex claim, sorry, explain or claim to explain the battlefield choices of non-state actors. Can you give a quick overview of those so that our listeners have an understanding of what kind of the status quo assumptions about non-state warfare are? Yeah, I think the most common view out there is uh, materialist. So the one of the most common assumptions about non-state actors is that relative to better funded, larger, better equipped state militaries, non-state actors don't have the tax base, they don't have the population, they don't have access to the same military material. And hence, because they're outnumbered and outgunned, they resort to uh, hit and run methods, assassinations, car bombings, suicide vests, uh, wearing civilian clothing and melting into the civilian population as ways to survive against these materially superior state armies. So the, the most common implicit view out there is that because non-state actors are materially inferior, they resort to these kinds of distinctive guerrilla methods, if you like, uh, as a way of staying alive uh, against better equipped state armies. So that, that's one. There's a subset of materialists um, that differ at the margin from the ordinary materialists. So the, there's a group that believes that material is what's basically driving everybody's behavior, uh, but there's new material coming down the pike for non-state actors, you know, precision guided weapons especially. And so there's a hybrid materialist argument that holds that these new precision guided high firepower weapons are enabling actors to combine high-tech lethality with guerrilla tactics. And so you get this argument that there's this new form of hybrid warfare in which still it's basically the, the material, the technology that's driving the expectation of different behavior. In the hybrid case, the different behavior is different lethality from a similarly terroristic, similarly guerrilla-ish you know, operating style. Now, in addition to materialists, there's also a view out there that uh, sees tribal culture as being at the heart of all this. And the tribal culture argument uh, holds that uh, many non-state actors uh, are coming from uh, cultural backgrounds that emphasize uh, segmented lineage. The kind of cliche that sums up this argument is the probably apocryphal Bedouin aphorism that says, me and my brother against my cousin, me and my cousin you know, against somebody else, and all of us against the outsider. And the, the idea is you get these shifting alignments as a function of the shifting proximity of blood relationships among individuals. And in these kind of ever shifting arrangements as a function of the complexity of, of uh, overlapping blood lineage, uh, you therefore get very fluid military styles that aren't characterized by f large formal military organizations or heavy equipment or defensive linear positions or any of the rest, but instead emphasize these kinds of hit and run, melt away when challenged, you know, nominally guerrilla methods, because it's the, the best fit with uh, tribalist cultural norms. Uh, and in which if one of these militaries tries, you know, massed, you know, rural high firepower combat actions to destroy the enemy, to take and hold ground, uh, they would find it too alien, too difficult to adopt and wouldn't be successful. So either of these two views, right, the, the most common view, which is basically materialist, non-state actors use nominally guerrilla methods because they're too outgunned to do anything else. And the kind of tribal culturalist view, non-state actors use nominally guerrilla methods because it's a better fit to the way the culture is wired together and other methods would be too alien. Um, that They both tend to predict that non-state actors will fight in this asymmetric, irregular, guerrilla-ish way, either because they're outnumbered and outgunned or because they're uh, culturally tribalist 
uh, either way, you get a similar expectation for how these actors will fight. So let's assume for a moment you're right. And the military, acad- academicians, the strategic studies mafia is kind of sauntering about with these unexamined ideas about non-state warfare. Why would that matter? What, why would that be a problem? Well, if you run into a non-state actor who doesn't behave that way, and there are plenty of them out there, uh, the result can be pretty nasty if you're expecting the kind of behavior that people have historically associated with non-state actors. So take, for example, the case of the Israelis in Lebanon in 2006. So Israel had absorbed this kind of contemporary expectation for how non-state actors will fight and expected that their military future lay, for the ground forces at least, in things like uh, policing the occupied territories and dealing with the Intifada and dealing with non-state actors like Hamas and Hezbollah. The state threat from Syria or others would be dealt with largely by the Israeli Air Force. The ground forces, therefore, were in the process by 2006 of transforming themselves from a heavily equipped, you know, conventionally oriented military designed to deal with the Syrian or other Arab state threat into what was thought to be the right kind of military to deal with these irregular, guerrilla, asymmetric, non-state opponents that they saw were, thought were increasingly the job of the Israeli army. Uh, so they had uh, stopped training in the uh, combined arms involving the integration of infantry, armor, and artillery. Uh, They had stopped training for maneuver against dug-in prepared positions in rural areas. Uh, And instead, their training syllabus and increasingly their organization and equipment had been shifting over to what someone who expected non-state actors to fight in the way I talked about earlier, hit and run, uh, melt away, don't hold ground, use... You know, assassinations, ambushes, snipers, and suicide vests, and so on. Uh, if that's what you expect, you should operate your military differently. Lighter forces, less orientation to operating together with armor, uh, more dispersed on your own part, uh, very careful, discriminant use of violence to make sure you don't kill the innocent civilians that the uh, asymmetric warriors are going to be intermingled with. Uh, And then suddenly they found themselves in 2006 fighting a non-state actor in the form of Hezbollah who didn't use the canonically asymmetric, canonically irregular, ostensibly guerrilla method of fighting that everybody expected. Hezbollah in 2006, if, if I just described the campaign to you and described Hezbollah's methods in 2006 and didn't use the word Hezbollah and didn't tell you that it was in southern Lebanon you would be forgiven for assuming that I was talking about the Wehrmacht on the Eastern Front in 1944, right? Their methods on the ground were surprisingly state-like, surprisingly, I don't tend to like the use of the term, but if we want to, intuitively conventional. And the result of this was tremendous difficulty for a well-equipped, modernized, westernized state army in the form of the Israel Defense Force, which ultimately prevailed in the war, but took much heavier casualties than anyone expected and encountered a degree of frustration and difficulty in a way that uh, probably cost the government at the time uh, its majority and certainly cost the Israeli chief of staff at the time his job. So if, if you get this wrong and you assume that all non-state actors use these kind of guerrilla irregular, asymmetric, kind of intuitive ways of fighting, and then you run into one that doesn't, as the Israeli did, Israelis did in 2006, the, the results are unpleasant. Um, so you know, there's more to designing one's own military than coming up with the right expectation for how the enemy will operate, but that's an important part of the process. And if you have incorrect, unsound expectations for how your enemies are going to fight in the future, you will then have a tendency to design the wrong kind of military in response and design the wrong kind of doctrine and tactics and training in response. And the result can be unnecessary levels of casualties, unnecessary degrees of frustration. And if you're very unfortunate, perhaps military failure. Uh, So the, the, the stakes in getting this right are significant. 
think you've you've convinced me. It wasn't you know the the three hundred something odd pages, the the rigorous social scientific method, and the the incredibly dense appendix. It was that answer right there. So so now I'm with you. So now I believe that that the stakes are high. So the next question is, why are non-state actors fighting the way that they do? Uh, what is driving this change in their military methods? Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad I persuaded you, but listeners out there, you go ahead and read all 300 pages anyway. Uh, you know, if, if you've gone Seconded. to all the trouble of writing all 300 <laughs> pages, then you want people to read it. So uh, uh, please, please read it. Why uh, then is there all this variation? An important, a fine and important question to, to pose. Um, Again, I tend to think the orthodox views uh, don't tell the whole story. Material is certainly relevant. Uh, tribal culture can certainly be relevant. But when I look at the the variance in behavior that I see out there in the real world, I mean, I'm quite impressed with the politics of non-state actors. And in particular, with the degree to which they're institutionalized and the degree to which they see their stakes in their wars as existential as opposed to limited. Uh, there's actually a lot of variation between non-state actors in how formally institutionalized they are, and a lot of variation among non-state actors in the degree to which they see the stakes in the wars they fight as existential as opposed to limited. Um, consider, for example, uh, UNITA uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which waged a long uh, insurgency that was oriented mostly around control of economic assets like diamond mines. Very little likelihood that the Angolan government was going to conquer and destroy UNITA and kill its leadership. Very little likelihood that UNITA was going to conquer the entire Angolan state. The war was about control at the margin of economic resources. These stakes are you know, reasonably limited. That implies uh, a limited degree of willingness to invest in expensive, complicated training. So if a non-state actor is going to fight the way Hezbollah did in 2006, right, the, you know, careful use of cover and concealment in rural terrain to uh, take and hold ground uh, and sustain defensive positions against you know, sizable state militaries, to do that effectively requires a very high level of skill and proficiency. That skill and proficiency can only be obtained by training. Training is expensive, partly because you expend fuel and ammunition and other resources, and partly because you're pulling people away from other things that might be economically productive for you in order to have them spend time training. If what you're fighting over is control at the margin of some economic resource where you're not going to be annihilated if you, if you fail, you'll just get lower income then the business of expending vast amounts of money in training takes on a very different cast, right? The last thing you want to do in a war for economic benefit is spend more than the economic stake is worth. So, you know, non-state actors who see their stakes as limited have a disincentive to do the training investment required in order to use forces in a Hezbollah-like, you know, state-like way, whereas non-state actors who think that if they fail, the leadership will be... Uh, arrested, imprisoned, and possibly killed have a rather different incentive for them. Training is worth it. <laughs> we'll do whatever it takes, right? So stakes matter. The other part of the politics of non-state actors that I argue matters a lot uh, in their uh, choices in how to operate is the degree of institutional maturity at their disposal. And the issue here turns on the requirement for complex cooperation among interdependent specialists, if you're going to fight in the state-like, let's call it conventional, if you like, way that an actor like Hezbollah does. So, you know, for example, if I'm going to take and hold ground in a sustained slugfest with a large, well-equipped opponent, I need the ability to sustain uh, large volumes of ammunition expenditure. If I'm just a shadowy gorilla engaging in quick hit and run ambushes, I can empty the magazine at the enemy, melt into the countryside, disappear, and be fine. Uh, that doesn't demand an extensive logistical system. That doesn't demand an infrastructure that can resupply me with ammunition after I empty the magazine in the general direction of the enemy and then bug out. If I am going to 
sustain a defense of a position in a slugfest against a large, well-equipped state opponent, I need the ability to get resupplied with ammunition after I empty the magazine. I need the ability especially to engage in potentially large volumes of suppressive fire if I'm going to do things like fire and maneuver in defense of terrain. Um, If I'm going to maintain that position, I've got to maintain a high level of firepower that requires that I'm going to have to get resupplied by somebody else who's going to give me more ammunition. If I've got vehicles, more food, more fuel. If I'm going to do this for a long time, maybe more food, more water. Who's going to do that? Well, in most militaries that have displayed the ability to fight this way, there's some specialist or sub-organization that does the resupply function that operates in thin-skinned, vulnerable vehicles that are designed to have a large cargo load, but not to have a lot of armor protection or cross-country mobility, the ability to slug it out with the enemy. Those people, in turn, the, the specialists in resupply, have to be able to defend depend on the specialists in shooting at the front to keep them alive in their thin-skinned, high cargo capacity wheeled vehicles while they drive all this stuff forward for them. If the people at the front don't do their job and the enemy comes streaming through the lines, it's not a smart idea for me to drive towards the enemy in my cargo truck full of ammunition. (laughs) Bad idea. The people at the front have to be able to trust the resupply unit to provide the ammunition or else the last thing I'm going to do is expend it all, right? The people transporting the ammunition have to trust the trigger pullers at the front to protect them while they bring the ammunition forward. This degree of trust between mutually dependent specialists is really hard to do without some kind of institutional structure that creates a sustained interaction among large numbers of different specialists who develop the expectation that because the organization is reliable, I can depend on that truck showing up. And because I can depend on the organization and therefore I can depend on the truck showing up, I can therefore expend all of my ammunition to sustain my defensive ground because I can be confident that more is going to appear. If I am a non-state actor for Hezbollah, for instance, in 2006, I can pretty much rely on this because I know that Hezbollah has a very formally developed institutional structure where there's a separate civilian organization and a separate military wing. The military wing has a separate intelligence and operations agency. The operations agency has specialized recruitment, combat action, indoctrination, and other functional offices. All of these organizations interact and do training over time so they get used to the idea that they can expect one another to function in the ways that you know you increasingly rely upon and because of that enormous and elaborate and formal and long-lived institutional structure shooters at the front can for example trust logistic logisticians in the rear to keep them resupplied people who are doing fire support can trust the units that are doing maneuver. People who are doing intelligence can trust the trigger pullers. All these, you know, this array of interdependent specialists required in order to fight the way we tend to think of as state-like require mutual trust that is much easier to establish when there's an institutional infrastructure to regularize all these interactions. Not all non-state actors have that. So, you know, Hezbollah did in 2006. The Sri Lankan LTTE did in its fight with the Sri Lankan government. Al-Qaeda did in Afghanistan. The Croatian separatist ZNG did in the Croatian War of Independence. The Ulster Volunteer Force in the 1970s did not. The RUF in Sierra Leone in 1995 did not. The RCD in Congo did not. The Somali National Alliance in Somalia in the 1990s did not. These kinds of other non-state actors with different political organizations 
classically had small, centralized, personalized leaderships, very little division of labor, a limited ability from, for the plenary leadership to control subordinate organizations, substantial risks of factionalism and distrust among factions. If the political organization of your you know, entity looks like that, it would be extremely dangerous to expend all of my ammunition in a slugfest with a state enemy. Because the, how in the world can I expect that an organization consisting largely of kind of people who drink in the same bar, right, like the UVF, are going to, at risk of their own lives, show up with a truck full of more ammunition to keep me sustained and fueled and, and uh, rearmed and able to hang in there. Far better if I just hold the trigger down on full automatic spray bullets until I empty the magazine and then melt away into the urban landscape, right? So you get a lot of variation from one non-state actor to another, not just in the stakes for which they fight and thus the degree to which paying for all his training makes sense, but also in the degree of formality of the political institutions by which the non-state actor manages its activities in ways that powerfully shape the degree of trust that one can safely specialize and one can safely do only one part of the job of staying alive in combat and have confidence that somebody else who I may never have met, somebody else from a different tribe, somebody else from a different subgroup, somebody else from a different village is going to show up when I need them in order to keep me supplied. This kind of political variation in stakes and in institutions, I argue in the book, accounts for a lot of the variation we see, and we see a lot, in the actual tactics and military operations that different non-state actors conduct when they find themselves in wars. So yours being a rationalist theory, it's not just predictive of what methods a given non-state actor will employ under a certain set of conditions. It's also explanatory of military performance when observed methods diverge from expected methods. Can you talk, talk about some of the examples you found in the cases that, that followed that pattern? Yeah, I mean, like most kind of soft rationalist theories, uh, mine operates on an assumed causal mechanism of selection effects, that uh, non-state actors don't sit around reading books and calculating the right way to use force necessarily, but they, they try things and those that uh, make mistakes get removed from the system, either because they get killed or because their organization is destroyed or because they encounter bad results and try something else. And the ones that, that survive the selection process then kind of vector in over time on something that looks like the result of an explicit calculation, whether the actor is involved calculated and correctly or not. If that's the case, then at any given, at any given moment, most non-state actors will be behaving kind of way the, the way the book predicts, but some will be in the process of learning. <laughs> And some will be in the process of removal from the system for their errors. Uh, and uh, the book actually looks at one particularly, what, a case that I find particularly interesting, of the latter. Uh, the Croatian Serb uh, militia, the SVK, and the way they behaved in the latter years of uh, the Croatian participation in the Balkan Wars. The Croatian Serb SVK was characterized by an extremely weak institutional structure and by a belief that they faced limited stakes because they thought that the Yugoslav state army would re-intervene in Croatia as it had in the early stages of the war to save them, their kind of Serbian uh, sugar daddies in Belgrade would prevent them from being annihilated. And therefore the war in the view of the Croatian Serbian SVK militia wasn't about survival and extermination. It was about at the margin, how much of Croatia are we gonna control and which of our various factions are going to get the upper hand uh, when we eventually get recognized by the international community. So they hoped and, and become a state. Uh, 
and because of this uh, limited perception of stakes and weak institutional structure, the book says the smart move, SVK, is don't try and fight the way Hezbollah did. Use methods more like the ones you see from the Somali National Alliance or, or other you know, actors whose behavior is closer to the kind of orthodox popular image of guerrilla warfare, disperse, intermingle with the civilian population, rely on hit and run methods, don't stand in the defensive ground. Uh, that's not what they did. What they did was to dig trenches, deploy barbed wire, try to engage in a positional defense of the terrain they held uh, in the Kraina uh, in southern Croatia and uh, slug it out with what eventually became the independent Croatian state military, the HV. And the book basically says there are good reasons why if you're weakly institutionalized and if your stakes are limited, it's a bad idea to behave this way because if you do, it will go badly for you. And it went very badly for them in Operation Storm of 1995, the Croatian uh, military basically wiped them out in a matter of days uh, and reconquered the entirety of the terrain that they occupied and uh, destroyed them as a political military entity. Um, so, you know, rationalist theories, you know, have, you know, give you a reason <laughs> for why you should behave the way the theory prescribes. Uh, and the SVK is not a bad example uh, of what those reasons look like in practice. Um, the SVK uh, behaved differently and suffered for it. That's a nice segue because I wanted to ask you about something that at least on the surface appears irrational. Um, and that is this fascinating implication of your theory that under certain conditions, we should expect a non-state actor to respond to the introduction of even more overpowering opposing force by adopting more as opposed to less conventional methods. And that flies right in the face of some of the major materialist theories of non-state military methods. Can, can you talk about that a little bit, perhaps with reference to Somalia in 1993? Sure. Excellent choice of case for this point, I must, Thank you. Thank I you. must add. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the Somali National Alliance is a particularly interesting example here, right? So um, for most of the civil warfare that followed the fall of the Siad Bari government in Somalia, the SNA was fighting against a variety of other Somali militias. Relatively weak opposition, not radically materially different from the the endowment of the SNA. Um, you would expect, if you were a materialist, that an actor that was not at a major material disadvantage would be inclined to use, you know, ostensibly conventional methods. Then uh, the UN gets involved, and especially the UN sends an American admiral. Uh, Admiral Howe to command its operations because it was out because the UN was outraged at the Somali militia's interference with the delivery of humanitarian aid to a starving Somali public, um, and you would and this intervention of the UN and the U.S. military and Admiral Howe suddenly put the SNA at a major material disadvantage relative to this new opponent, which was heavily armed, heavily equipped, very well trained. And you would look at this, and if you're a materialist, you'd say the smart move for the SNA at this point is become, fight conventionally before that, then become irregular guerrillas when the the heavily armed state soldiers show up. And in fact, you see the exact opposite. The SNA becomes more conventional, not less, as you suggested, after the, the Americans and the UN show up with all their firepower and their equipment. And the reason for this has to do with the change in the political environment and especially a change in the stakes that the Somali National Alliance faced. Somali institutions were weakly institutionalized throughout, right? Not a lot of change there. Uh, but their stakes changed radically when Howe showed up. 
before Howe shows up, it's a classic limited war for economic stakes. Various militias would like to control aid distribution points and ports and productive agricultural land and other things that can generate revenue because the war is about revenue. But the last thing you want to do is, is overspend the value of the revenue you're trying to control. When Howe shows up, however, Howe immediately declares as a war aim the arrest and imprisonment of the Somali warlords that are outraging him and the West by their interference with these aid flows. And so Howe starts literally putting up wanted posters all over Mogadishu, demanding the arrest of Muhammad Farid Aidid. Um, moreover, he backs up the threat with real military action. He starts dispatching uh, Delta Force commandos supported by American uh, Ranger infantry to try and grab uh, militia leaders. You know, flex cuff them, you know, you know, blindfold them, and spirit them away to jail somewhere in American-controlled territory. Uh, in one of these raids, uh, American uh, helicopters uh, end up destroying uh, most of a building in which the Somali National Alliance leadership was meeting, trying to figure out how to respond to all this, killing a bunch of their leadership, but not ID the intended target. And the result of all this is ID the leader of the Somali National Alliance, and all of his lieutenants quickly understand that the stakes have suddenly become existential for them. If they don't you know, do something, Hal really is going to capture them and spirit them off to prison or worse, who knows where, or blow them up in a Hellfire missile strike. And the result of that is a change in Somali National Alliance military behavior on the ground. They don't become Hezbollah, right? They don't become the U.S. Marine Corps, but they move in the direction of an increased effort to take and hold territory because they need ter a, a, a territory that is reasonably large and reasonably resistant to American patrols in which ID and his lieutenants can hide. If the United States has complete access to all of Mogadishu and can go wherever it wants, whenever it wants, sooner or later, they're going to run into him and capture him. So Idid needs some way of establishing a defended zone in which he can safely live and move around. And what he ends up doing is taking the Black Sea District and the Bakara Market within Mogadishu, setting up outposts on its edges to detect incoming American patrols, putting observers outside the U.S. base uh, at the, the port facility. And once they detect the departure of an American patrol or an American raid from base, send the word out to Somali National Alliance militiamen all over Mogadishu to you know, immediately concentrate in the Bakara Market Black Sea District where Aidid was hiding and counterattack the American incursion to drive it back out of this real estate. And in fact, these front lines, if you like, were remarkably clearly defined. There were specific roads and specific checkpoints where American patrols could travel without interference until they passed that intersection, and then they were met by a fusillade of small arms fire. And then if they turned around and went back out, the fire would all stop when they crossed that intersection, right? And this, this was all an attempt to hold ground because Idid believed that if he couldn't hold a certain amount of ground, he'd personally lose his freedom or lose his life uh, or both. Now, this does not represent some effort to kind of dig in a series of trench lines along a clearly delineated border with wire obstacles in front of them. And if a single American boot crossed the line, then that American would be annihilated. That This was a more elastic conception of the control of ground, right? The Americans were going to be able to enter Black Sea Bacar market, but then they would be violently counterattacked quickly in an attempt to drive them back out and in that way make kind of routine American movement within the area hard to do. So, but, but this is not unlike 
a fair number of the way uh, of states and the way they defend ground. So one of the advantages of having spent a lot of time studying interstate warfare before turning to the subject matter is familiarity with the way states defend ground. Very few states who survive long enough to be part of the empirical record very long have that kind of fragile, shallow, forward defensive system either. The modern system, as I call it in my earlier book, Military Power, has prescribes for state militaries that they defend ground using an elastic defense in depth in which attackers are allowed to enter the defensive system or exhausted while within it and then are driven back out by counterattack. That's very similar to the model of territorial control that Muhammad um, Farah Idid in the Somali National Alliance militia in Mogadishu in 1993 was doing. And in my view, this SNA behavior is a clear response to a political change, to a change in the nature of the perceived stakes in the fight after Admiral Howe shows up and declares that Idid's death or capture is now his war aim. Let's move to implications. What does the theory predict about state and non-state actors' military methods in the future? Yeah, I, I think what we're going to see is a couple of changes progressively over time. One is the, the most common non-state military behavior is going to come increasingly to resemble the most common state military behavior. The, the modal behavior of these two classes of actors are moving closer together. But because uh, the political organization of non-state actors is diverse and is going to continue to be diverse, there's going to be variance around the mode, around the most common values. So I, I, my, my expectation for the future is that as technology changes and as technology encourages those non-state actors whose politics will permit it to behave in a more state-like way, there will be others whose political organization will not permit them to take advantage of the opportunity that technology creates to become more state-like and instead will continue to be, you know, to fight in ways that are closer to the way actors like uh, we saw the UVF doing in the 1970s or the Somali National Alliance before the arrival of Admiral Howe, for instance. So I expect to see increased variance around a mode that will be more state-like uh, in the future. And on the flip side, what are the implications for defense strategists and planners in the United States? Yeah, I think the the implication of this for the United States is kind of a back to the future kind of story. Um, so you, you can look at the debate over restructuring the American military over the last, say, 20 years um, as being really the story of two different transformation schools. Right? The, there was one argument that says that we need to radically redesign the U.S. military uh, because there's been a big change in technology, right? After the 1991 Gulf War, the view that new uh, sensing uh, and precision guidance and networked information technologies uh, were transforming war, and we should therefore transform the American military to respond to this. And the nature of this high-tech transformation's implications for the U.S. military is more capital, less labor. Get out of the close combat business, shrink the end strength of the U.S. Army and the U.S. Marine Corps, shift resources toward the Air Force and the Navy, and to some extent the special forces uh, combatants that act as target acquirers for these sources of standoff precision firepower that new technology is empowering and enabling. So, you know, get out of the close combat business, shrink the ground forces, less labor, more standoff precision air power, more capital. As the insurgencies in Iraq and Afghanistan ginned up in sort of 2004-ish, 2005-ish, the future warfare debate stood on its head. And there was a new transformation argument. And the new transformation argument is that warfare is being transformed 
not by new technology, but by new opponents. The opponents of the future are going to be these non-state actors. And because we all know that non-state actors use irregular, asymmetric, guerrilla methods. The last thing we want is more capital and less labor. We want more labor and less capital. We want a larger army and Marine Corps. We want less heavy equipment in the army and the Marine Corps. We want to emphasize not speed and standoff precision, but persistent population security, right? And and so you get precisely the opposite argument that we should completely transform the military. I mean, radically change it relative to the kind of balanced force of, you know, long range firepower and close combat and heavy equipment and dismounted infantry that the legacy military had. The, the first transformation argument says, ah, get rid of that old dinosaur legacy military. It's got too much infantry in it. The new transformation argument says, ah, get rid of that dinosaur old legacy military because it doesn't have enough infantry in it. The, the argument in the book implies that the legacy dinosaur military actually doesn't look that bad because it's got a mix of some firepower, you know, some you know, long distance standoff capability, some armor and heavy equipment, some infantry of the kind that you would expect might be useful for dealing with situations like you know, Hezbollah in Lebanon in 2006, an opponent who uses cover and concealment in the terrain uh, to sustain defense of positions and requires combined arms, you know, firepower and maneuver with careful use of terrain for cover and concealment to overcome. You, you want a mix of friendly capabilities to deal with that situation. The kind of standoff precision military that high-tech transformation advocates want has a lot of trouble against that kind of target set because its use of the complexity of the Earth's surface for cover and concealment makes it very hard for standoff precision to find targets to precisely engage. This is an argument that I made at length in the earlier book, Military Power. Um, for this kind of opponent, you don't want a high-tech transformation model because it leaves you without enough close combat capability to deal with opponents of you know, Hezbollah-ish behavior that can cover and conceal themselves too well. But neither do you want the kind of military that the low-tech transformation school advocates because it lacks the firepower that you need to deal with these dug-in opponents who are trying to contest the control of ground. What you want is a mix, something that looks more like kind of a medium weight force that is not hugely different than the American military of the later years of the Cold War. Um, so I, I think there's a good reason to believe that both of the visionary, forward thinking, out of the box transformation arguments in you know, the debate of the last 20 years are optimized around styles of, oppo- of opposition that are probably going to be less frequent in the future and not more. The high-tech transformation school is optimized against exposed enemies who don't exploit the complexity of their surface for covering concealment, which can be found and destroyed by standoff weaponry. Those are becoming less common, the book argues. The low-tech transformation argument would optimize the U.S. military against the exact opposite sort of behavior, the highly irregular, highly asymmetric, highly guerrilla kind of opposition that the book argues is not going away, but is also becoming relatively less common in the future. So if you know the, the, the forward-looking, outside-the-box-ish types are both oriented towards backward-looking views of how the enemy is likely to fight. I think a, an appropriately forward-looking view of how the enemy is going to fight would suggest a military that's a lot less different than the old-fashioned legacy dinosaur military that everyone loves to hate uh, than people suppose. Well, I'll move now from the very practical, very high stakes to the world of academia. Uh, the book as a whole is a very convincing argument against the validity of the categorical distinction between state and non-state military methods. Yet you ultimately insist that your theory does not necessarily apply to states. And I understand why, as a careful and thorough academic, you're not ready to make that claim. Uh, 
Uh, but I'd love to push you for what I suppose is your unscientific opinion on the likelihood of whether this theory does apply to states. And to the, to the extent that it doesn't, what are your initial thoughts on kind of candidates for competing variables that, you know, future scholars should consider uh, as they try to uh, develop a state-focused theory of military methods? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are elements of this argument that uh, travel well into the world of interstate warfare. So stakes, for example, are very likely to shape the degree of state investment in training as they shape non-state investment in training for similar reasons. Um, there are variations in the institutional maturity of modern states. Uh, some states have well-established uh, institutional architectures for adjudicating conflict among armed elites and preventing lethal factionalism. Others much less so. Um, and that uh, probably goes a fair way to explaining some of the more important variation in the performance of different state militaries in the world today, for example. So consider, um, for example, uh, Ba'athist Iraq under Saddam Hussein. The institutional weakness of the Iraqi state and the radically conflictual nature of civil military relations that created in Iraq probably had a lot to do with the Iraqi military's difficulties in interstate putatively conventional warfare against the United States in 1991 and, and 2003. Uh, if Saddam Hussein had allowed the degree of autonomous, uh, independent decision-making by low-level commanders who are going to rely on and trust other specialists within the Iraqi military that you would need in order to fight the way I've been describing as the, the preferred method for states, the odds that they decide that they ought to change who's running the country and assassinate Saddam Hussein go way up. So in settings like Ba'athist Iraq, where the institutional political structure of the Iraqi state created weak institutions for adjudicating conflict, uh, the kind of dangerously conflictual civil military relations you get cause rational state leaders to uh, deny their military the training and the independence uh, and uh, the autonomy that it needs in order to do these very complicated military behaviors that we traditionally associate with effective, nominally conventional warfighting. Um, another good example might be the current Afghan national security forces, where uh, weak state institutions for adjudicating conflict among multiple armed elites creates a requirement that a weak civilian leadership internally balance and that they uh, make sure, for example, that the uh, new state military doesn't get strong enough or proficient enough or uh, uh, professional enough to threaten the dozen to two dozen warlords around the country. And the best way to do that, of course, is corruption and cronyism. Corruption buys the loyalty of the state military. Cronyism creates loyalty in the state military by connections of marriage or birth or, you know, experience in exile or other political linkages um, in ways that substantially reduce the military's likelihood of creating an internal imbalance of power and frightening warlords into marching on the capital, but also systematically interferes with the ability of the Afghan National Army and police force to function against outsiders like the Taliban and tends to systematically sap the organization's combat motivation and ability to take an old ground in the ways that, that we've been talking about. Uh, so there are a variety of, of examples out there where some of these same variables that I argue shape non-state behavior, stakes and strength of institutions, uh, look like they're likely to help us understand variations in the way states, rather than just non-state actors of military force, that said, the range of variation that you encounter among states overlaps, but is different from the range of variation you encounter in non-state actors. 
So there may be other variables that we would need to bring into the conversation to do an adequate job of explaining all of the variants we can observe in interstate warfare. So for example, um, Caitlin Talmadge, a uh, professor at Georgetown, has recently written an outstanding book, The Dictator's Army, that talks about the nature of threat perception as an important variable in shaping the behavior of state militaries, where a, a regime in a place like Iraq, for example, believes that the primary threat to its survival is internal in the form of armed sub-elites or coup d'etat from the military, then the state will prevent its own military from becoming proficient in these conventional military methods. But if you then get into a war with the Iranians, in which the Iranians declare as their war aim, putting your personal head on a stick, if you're Saddam Hussein, and it looks like they might win the war, then relatively speaking, now I'm more worried about the Iranians than I am about my own officer corps. And Professor Talmadge argues the uh, military structure in the Iraqi state will shift. And the regime will allow the military the autonomy and the training and the resources and the capacities that it needs in order to build the ability to fight effectively in this kind of conventional uh, idiom. Um, so, you know, the, there are, it, it, it's not necessarily the case that the theory in non-state warfare tells us everything we need to know about interstate conflict. But I think it tells us some of the things we need to know to understand interstate conflict. And I think this idea of treating states and non-state actors as special cases on a, in a broader theoretical relationship is one that has important potential. If any of you out there are thinking of doctoral dissertation topic choice, for example, uh, this strikes me as an interesting opportunity for new research. To what extent uh, are the shapers, the determinants of state military behavior similar to or different from the shapers and the determinants of non-state military behavior, given that both of them are taking place against this underlying context of the rationalist incentive structures that operate in the selection mechanism of war in the presence of changing military technology? One kind of wild card potential illustrative question that struck me to help explain the convergence in the military methods of non-states and states. Uh, I was thinking as I was reading this book of how you would code at a unit level, something like JSOC during the Iraq war. I mean, I don't know if that is something you're not willing to do, given that it is not officially to non-state actor as a subunit of a state military, but at least theoretically, to me, it's, it, it seems like a very illustrative example of how states are also adopting these or incorporating these methods that I think if you coded them with your system would look very uh, Fabian in uh, disposition and conduct. Yeah, let, let's hope that JSOC doesn't become a non-state actor. Um, <laughs> th there are those who think the American Special Forces community is off the reservation. Uh, I'm not quite as far as that. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm prepared. I have great confidence that, that JSOC will remain an instrument of the American state. Uh, that said, your, your underlying point has something to it. I mean, uh, if you look back at that earlier book that had military power, where I made the argument that a particular way of using force, what I called the modern system, uh, emerged out of a tough uh, process of natural selection in the trench stalemate of the First World War and has become you know, important to success and failure on the battlefield in more than a century of subsequent military experience and ask, what does it look like? In an important sense, it looks like conventional state militaries changing their behavior to get closer to what we have in historically intuitively thought of as the way guerrillas fight. Taking concentrated massed formations in the open and dispersing them, sacrificing some degree of massed firepower in exchange for cover and concealment in the terrain, not putting up a 
you know, stone curtain wall castle and preventing one enemy foot from crossing the line, but, but operating a more elastic style of defense in which you allow the enemy to take some ground while you counter concentrate and then counter attack to throw them back out again, in which you're operating more fluidly over the ground rather than rigidly defending every inch of the ground to the last cartridge. So I mean, in an important sense, when I say that I, I, I think the modal behavior of states and non-state actors are getting more similar over time, that is in part because non-state actors are becoming more Hezbollah-like and more you know, putatively conventional. In the, in the book, I reject the terms conventional and guerrilla in favor of, of, of terminology that you introduced a moment ago of Napoleonic and Fabian, because I think this idea of, of guerrilla warfare is mostly unhelpful. Um, so I define a, a continuous spectrum between something that really does look like the cartoon version of gorilla, which I call Fabian, to avoid you know, misidentification with the cartoon, and a cartoon version of the popular intuition of conventional warfare they call Napoleonic, and argue that almost nobody operates at either of those two poles. Real behavior is interior to those extrema. Uh, but... The, the book argues that non-state actor, the, the modal non-state actor is becoming more Napoleonic over time. But you'll, you'll note that I said the modes are moving together, and that's partly because of what states are doing. As I argued in the earlier book, the modal state is becoming less Napoleonic as they disperse more in order to do a better job of exploiting the complexity of the Earth's surface for cover and concealment, precisely in order to get out from under the increasingly lethal firepower that modern technology brings to the battlefield every year. Uh, faced with all that firepower, if you mass in exposed formations in the open, uh, your ability to survive what Ernst Jünger termed the modern storm of steel gets lower and lower and lower every year. Therefore, even states, great powers in world wars, have progressively over time adopted more of what people ordinarily think of as the guerrilla agenda, right? Disperse, be fluid, don't hold ground to the last cartridge, but give it up and retake it. You know, so the, the, in, in an important sense, uh, non-state actors are becoming more like states, at least the modal ones. But states are becoming more like non-state actors. And, and that's why these two modes are, are moving towards each other uh, over time. One more question before I let you go. Uh, and this is a current events question. You spent a chunk of time in Afghanistan. Are you surprised at what you're reading in the news right now in terms of how fast the Taliban are advancing? And we certainly don't have to kind of stovepipe your analysis into uh, the theory you developed in this book, but uh, to the ex is there any uh, any way that your theory here helps us understand the battlefield dynamics we're, we're, we're now witnessing in Afghanistan? Yeah, I mean, I I'm not as surprised as I wish I were. Um, Starting just very briefly on the, the Taliban side of things, uh, the, the Taliban, like most non-state actors, are an intermediate case. They're not uh, as conventional as Hezbollah was in 2006. They're not as conventional as the U.S. Army is, for example. But neither are they the pure guerrillas that have no interest in taking and holding ground that people tend to intuitively associate with non-state actors, in part because the uh, political circumstances of the Taliban are uh, not ideal for it. They are a, an alliance of factions uh, that have some ability to coordinate activity across them, but imperfect. Um, but they do see their stakes increasingly as uh, existential uh, in the sense that they, they see the, the opportunity to win outright and control everything they, they seek to control. Um, and their access to the kinds of technology that are creating the incentives for politically well-endowed non-state actors to move to the middle of the spectrum is very limited. Their Pakistani patrons have deliberately withheld from them the kind of precision, high firepower technology that a lot of non-state actors have had elsewhere, that Hezbollah certainly had in 2006, but even the Somali National Alliance had in the 1990s. 
the Somali militias in the Battle of Mogadishu, in principle, had access to wire-guided precision anti-tank weapons. They didn't use them for reasons the, the book talks about and explains largely in terms of their politics. Uh, the Taliban haven't had access to that because the Pakistanis don't want them to. So the, the Taliban has been intermediate. The, the main reason they've been taking ground hand over fist in recent weeks is not that they've become a conventional Hezbollah-like juggernaut. It's because the state military forces are laying down their arms and giving up. Uh, and either going over to the Taliban or disappearing into the population or crossing the border into neighboring countries. And that is an issue that, that's bound up centrally with the problem of combat motivation in a weakly institutionalized state. I, I hinted at some of this earlier in our, our talk. Um, I'm, I'm very impressed with the connection between the political organization of an actor and its military behavior. The things that the political structure enables or makes impossible or discourages. And in the case of the Afghan state, the, the very weak institutional infrastructure for adjudicating conflict among multiple armed elites, for the reasons I suggested earlier, has for 20 years systematically interfered with combat motivation and skill and proficiency in the regular Afghan National Army and Afghan police force, which for a long, long time had made them essentially a, a checkpoint military organization. The, because they didn't trust their leadership and because you know, the fuel for their vehicles had been sold on the black market and the, the, their equipment had been diverted into the black market and their units were at half strength because so many of them were ghost soldiers that were being used to generate you know, under the table payments to their officers and all these, these things, the, the troops in the ranks who understand that all this is going on are very reluctant to go out on patrol and risk their lives with a chain of command that is neither interested in nor, you know, equipped to keep them alive out there. And they prefer to sit tight behind HESCO barriers on checkpoints and in forward operating bases. Nonetheless, they had been willing to hold those positions when the United States had basically said that we are in the country and we are backstopping you. And if you get into really serious trouble, we'll fly airstrikes to bail you out. Uh, when the Biden administration announced a total withdrawal from the country in April, that changed all those expectations. A. B it pretty quickly created a fear in much of Afghanistan that the jig is up, that if the Americans are leaving, the situation is hopeless. And combat motivation in war uh, is subject to uh, serious contagion dynamics. Um, if I am in my foxhole defending my position uh, against the Taliban or whomever, and I believe that the rest of my unit is in their foxholes defending their positions, the smart self-preservation choice for me is stay in my foxhole and continue to resist. If I can do that and keep them from overrunning us, I'll live. Whereas if I get up out of the foxhole and run away, I risk getting hit in the back once I've abandoned my cover. So if you think everybody else is going to stay in there, it makes sense for you to stay in there. <laughs> But if you think everybody else is going to bug out, now me against the Taliban army, right? They're going to overrun me and kill me for sure if I stay where I am. If I get up and bug out, there's some chance I make it shot in the back, but there's some chance I might get away. So a lot of combat motivation has always depended on everybody's beliefs about everybody else. This is part of the reason why institutions matter so much, right? Is they tend to create trust and, you know, expectations about how others will behave based on repeated patterns of behavior shaped by organizations and institutions. Um, when the U.S. announced nationally a withdrawal date, that was a big signal to everybody in Afghanistan that you should start worrying about how everybody else is going to behave because everybody else heard that announcement too. And the minute units started surrendering, that just confirmed the fear for everybody. And this thing became a snowball rolling down the hill. 
every after the American announcement of withdrawal and this kind of uniform message to Afghans that something dramatic has just changed and badly. Every surrender increases everybody else's fears that everybody else is going to surrender, which increases everybody else's proclivity to surrender. And the thing just builds on itself. And as a result, this, this massive advance that the Taliban have made in recent weeks is not because they're annihilating Afghan National Army units in combat. It's because the Afghan National Army is laying down its arms. This is a, this is a crisis of combat motivation. And it's a crisis of combat motivation that has its roots in the political structure of the Afghan state. This isn't because Afghans are cowards. This isn't because some discrete set of leaders you know, have been uh, morally deficient and self-interested. That this is a reflection of deep structural features in the institutional design of the Afghan state. I might just add that this is an Afghan state that we set up. There is a huge ongoing tendency to shift the blame for what's going on onto the Afghans, right? If, if they really cared about their country, they'd defend it. Well, I mean, that's an awful tough ask of an individual who's worried also about his own survival and has suddenly different expectations about the behavior of everybody else and whose entire military career in the Afghan National Army has been shaped in a culture of, co of corruption and cronyism. That's a reflection of an institutional structure that the West designed for them. <laughs> We created the need for internal balancing in Afghanistan when we did not disarm Afghan warlords after the Taliban fell in 2001. The Afghan constitution of 2004 was set up in a conference of Westerners. Right? We are implicated up to our eyeballs in the structure of this state and the consequent inability of that state to field, uh, powerful military instruments. So, I mean, obviously the Afghans have to do the fighting and they've been doing a lot of fighting and doing a lot of dying actually over the last few years, their casualties incurred in this war have radically outstripped ours. Um, and you know, they do bear responsibility for defending their country and their society and their value structure but they're doing so within a political structure of institutions that creates powerful constraints and powerful incentives for the behavior of rational people who are living in that society and confronted with those institutions that we've seen work out similarly in a variety of other settings. And as the, organ as the, the outfit who created those institutions, we bear some responsibility for this. But anyway, I, I, am I surprised that the Afghan National Army is losing ground as rapidly as it is? No. Um, do I wish that the Biden administration had not announced a withdrawal? Yes. Not because I think we should stay there indefinitely or not because I think we could somehow defeat the Taliban militarily, but because war termination in a weakly institutionalized political system like this especially is profoundly a matter of negotiation and settlement. I happen to think all wars terminate in settlements, by the way. Explicit sometimes, tacit other times. But especially in this setting, if, the, if there was going to be an outcome to this conflict other than a Taliban takeover, it was going to have to happen through a negotiated settlement. Negotiations have been ongoing. The Biden withdrawal announcement, A, radically undermined the prospect of negotiating success by, success by handing the Taliban a good fraction of what they wanted. A lot of our remaining leverage was our ability to promise a withdrawal of American forces with the Taliban badly wanted only in exchange for a settlement of the war. We then gave them that unilaterally. Um, and radically demoralize the Afghan National Army, making it hard for them to hold out long enough for any meaningful negotiations to reach fruition. So I'm, I'm not surprised by what's happening, and I'm not a big fan of the withdrawal announcement that I think catalyzed a change from weak motivation that produced a very gradual loss of terrain into a collapse of motivation that, that's causing you know, massive 
changes in the control of terrain. Well, we're not going to have time to fully uh, respond to that, but uh, Dr. Belittle, your ability to, to speak elo- eloquently and persuasively uh, you know, in response to a question that I had not prepared you for is as good an argument for reading this book as any. Um, so thank you so much for coming on the show. And, uh, you know, I urge all of our listeners to, uh, pick up non-state warfare. You won't regret it. Thanks, Dr. Biddle. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me.